Well, I too am glad you're here on this Wednesday night. And uh, guys, let me remind you, tomorrow morning we have breakfast available just for us at the Maple Street Biscuit Company on 220. That's over by the Home Depot area. And uh, 6 o'clock is when we'll start. Uh, we'll be done about 640 so that you can get on the road and get down the, the road to work. But it'll be an encouraging time uh, during our, what we call the, the Better Man. So tomorrow morning... Uh, text somebody, invite somebody, remind them about it. I woke up this morning, and I thought that I missed it. Um, so don't miss it tomorrow. It's tomorrow. The other uh, thing I want to say to guys is that this coming month, October's coming up, and the last weekend of October, we're having a men's camp out uh, at a ranch where we used to do an event called the Real Men's Event. And the man, uh, men's camp out's going to be on a Friday night and a Saturday, Lots of uh, really encouraging plans for you to get out there, to relax, to enjoy God's creation, fellowship with other men, and be encouraged in the Word. So the last weekend of this month, I want you to come. It's for guys all ages, including if you have boys, you can bring your boys. If you think that they can handle a camp out, they're old enough to come. That's up to you, and you can bring them, all right? We're in Hebrews chapter 11 Hebrews chapter 11, have your Bibles open there, Hebrews chapter 11, and just these introductory remarks, I don't typically say things like this, I don't usually say, hey, this is a familiar passage, Um, because all passages probably uh, to us who've been saved for some time are somewhat familiar, but we can never become too, too familiar with them. Um, there's always something in the Word that's going to speak to us. Can I get an amen there, right, if you know what I'm talking about? Um, and I have preached from Hebrews chapter 11 on at least three occasions, at least these verses that I'm covering this morning, uh, at least three, I think maybe more. And it was Charles Spurgeon that said, and Charles Spurgeon was uh, a pastor in England in the 19th century that uh, basically said, when you're on the road, never preach anything new. And at home, never preach anything old. At our old church, they would say, don't warm up a biscuit. Serve fresh biscuits when you're at church. And I can tell you tonight, I'm not preaching from Hebrews 11, a passage that I preached before, a message that I preached before. That's not going to necessarily make it better. It's just going to be fresh. Is that all right? And what I'm asking for you that to know this passage for it to be fresh uh, for you as well. What is really helpful, just moving in one more um, statement about this text, is I've never preached through Hebrews. And so now coming to chapter 11 and another very familiar passage, which is chapter 12, they have taken on a lot more meaning, not new meaning, more meaning. The meaning was always there but I have a better grasp of chapter 11 and chapter 12, and I hope you will as well. If you've not gone through this passage with us as we've been coming here on Wednesday nights, okay, uh, you'll get a lot out of this. And as well, I, I think that you're going to, if you've never heard chapter 11, it's going to be good for you as well. So we're in uh, Hebrews chapter 11. This passage is famously called the Hall of Faith. How many of you have ever heard Hebrews 11 called the Hall of Faith? Raise your hand. If you haven't, don't worry about it. Okay, some of you haven't, but most of you have. So that tells me a lot. It tells me that most of you are familiar with this passage, and even those of you who have not heard that are familiar with this passage. It's laden with men and women who are in it for one reason. Because they had faith in God. And they made this text as an example to us so that we are told, since you are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, since you have before you people that were faithful, who were people of faith, you too, you as well, can live a life of faith. And so as you think about the the people we're going to look at over the next couple of weeks, Know this, they're therefore our example. We have some Old Testament saints that are there for our example not to follow. And Paul tells us that. But these are men and women that we can follow their example. Now, interestingly enough, 
it's good to have examples that the writer of Hebrews goes to in chapter 12 to Jesus to say, however, though you have examples, you can glance at it as Jesus you put your gaze on. Because what's beautiful about the people that are in Hebrews 11 is that they're men and women of flesh, like our Lord Jesus, but with clay feet, unlike our Lord Jesus. Our Lord Jesus, we've been taught in Hebrews, is like us, tempted in every way, knowing therefore our weakness, and that he empathizes with us. But we're looking at examples here that are not perfect. Jesus is our perfect example because he's the perfect man. He is the better man. Hebrews 11, not perfect people, but there for one reason, faith. So how many of you, don't raise your hand here, uh, but you would say, I'm not perfect. I'm not perfect. But can you be a man or a woman of faith? And the answer is yes. And I want us to see this text. If you have your Bibles, Hebrews chapter 11, we're going to read 1 through 10. Stand, if you will, and let's read this together. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. They received commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. By faith Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous. God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. I think you see a common word here when you see those words used over and over, you want to pick up on maybe there's a meaning here I need to learn, and that is commended, commended. Because without faith, it is impossible to please him, or here's another way to say it, without faith, it is impossible to be commended by God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Notice verse 7, by faith Noah, being warned by God concerning events yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, what did he do? He condemned the world. Was the world commended or condemned? And why? Because they did not please God. They did not please God because they did not have faith. You see the theme running through here that faith is what pleases God and it is the way in which we are commended by God. So righteousness comes by faith. Verse 8, by faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out of the place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went out to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the, of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. Praise be to God for his word. Thank you for standing. Let's get into this because now, that's how 11 starts. Chapter 11 starts this way. Now, now. Great word telling us that something is about to happen based on what has previously. Previously, we've been told that God has given us in Jesus Christ a much better priest and a much better sacrifice. Now we have a much better principle to follow, a much better principle than those around that were following after their own religious ideas, because God is not impressed by our religious ideas or our works of righteousness, but he is impressed, if I can use that word, by our faith, or he's pleased by our faith. Now, faith is believing God, and it believes that God saves Faith believes that God saves. For by grace are you saved through faith. But I want to think about what faith is based on the text here. 
Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. Jesus told a blind man, or two blind men on one occasion, according to your faith, be it unto you. That would be true for us tonight. How blessed do we expect to be? Well, it will be according to your faith. Jude tells us in Jude, the fifth chapter, there's one chapter, a fifth verse in the the chapter that's given to us, that there were men and women from Israel that were, they, they were rescued by God from Egypt, but they did not go into the promised land because they did not believe. The, the reality is, you and I are saved by our faith, by believing, and those who are not saved are sa- not saved because they do not believe. But I want us for a minute to pause. Are you ready to pause? Say pause. Aren't there a lot of people who believe in God and that Jesus died and that salvation is in Jesus? But they never darken the door of a church. They never show any true fruit of that belief. They are out and you can ask them, do you believe? And they go, I believe. I believe all of that. I believe all of that about Jesus that you've taught. I believe all of the gospel. But it has not changed their life. Do they really believe? Now, none of us can look at someone's heart and say, well, this person believes, and oh, this person doesn't, and this person does, and this person doesn't. We don't know. But there are many, many people who accept in their mind the facts about Jesus and have some semblance of belief, but that are not saved. Then therefore, that wouldn't be the kind of faith that pleases God. So there must be something beyond just a mental assent to the truth that I accept. The mental accept, assent to the truth of Jesus that I accept. There must be something else to faith. And you'd be right. Because if you have biblical faith, true faith, you'll have an active faith, active faith, and you'll have a, not only an active faith, you'll have a working faith. You see, none of us are saved by our works, we're saved by grace, but when we have faith in God and are saved by grace, we then work. Faith is always active, faith is active, and we're going to see what true biblical faith is from this text. You notice how that the writer of Hebrews at this point is is just telling the folks that are following after Christ, don't quit, persevere, persevere in Christ. And the evidence that you are persevering uh, in Christ is your faith. Your faith. If we were to go back to chapter 10 and we would read in chapter 10 how that the writer tells those that are following after Christ, don't shrink back, don't draw back but keep pressing into Christ the the perseverance in Christ is evident through faith notice the description of faith that's here we never have a definition of faith in the Bible It'd be nice to have this crisp clean definition of faith but faith is a lot like love and hope how do you define love read first Corinthians 13 you have a description of love don't you You have a demonstration of love in Jesus Christ who put on display the love of the Father and that he gave his life for us. And you have that same idea when it comes to hope. When you talk about hope for the believer, hope is not a wish. Hope is far more than that. So it's very hard to describe even our hope because it is so concrete. And then you come to faith. And it's really difficult to define faith. And so what the writer of Hebrews does for us under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is gives us a description of faith that we can sink our teeth into and understand faith. He says this, faith is assurance of things hoped for. Look in verse 1, and the conviction of things not seen. True Bible faith, as one man says, is confidence in God so much that we are obedient in spite of circumstances or consequences. The writer of Hebrews says, faith is based on assurance, or you might have in your Bible the word substance, that faith is full of substance. That's what I want. That's what I want. I want substance. All throughout Hebrews, the writer is encouraging the believers in that they have substance, not just symbols and shadows. Those were awesome, wonderful, 
But the symbols and shadows of the Old Testament pointed to the substance that they have in Christ. And when it comes to faith, I want substance. None of us would ever ascribe to the idea that some have about us that we are blind in our faith and that we step out onto blind faith steps. We have a substance. And there is evidence for why we have substance. We have a conviction. That word conviction is evidence. And that, that fact that we have faith in God and this conviction that he's real and that he's true and that he does what he says leads to a commendation to us. So faith is assurance. It's even an assurance of um, things not seen. We know that there are things that we don't see and believe, but yet we know that God created everything out of nothing and we believe that. Verse 3, by faith we understand the universe was created by the word of God, that God spoke everything to existence. Where did everything come from? God there was nothing, and then there was everything. That is completely opposite of what the naturalistic evolutionist teaches, that somehow, someway, there were particles that all came together by chance at some point, and when they collided, that, that by chance started a chain reaction, and here we are today, evolving evermore. We don't believe that. In fact, we think that takes a lot of crazy faith. That does take blind faith. That takes the kind of blind faith that just doesn't make sense. What's real more logical is that there is a creator because we look at our world and we go, there has to be an order because everything is ordered and therefore there must be an orderer. I mean, you just look at the world and so we know that everything is here. Why? Because God said it. We weren't there when it happened, but God was and he told us how it happened and uh, he said he spoke everything into existence. And I believe that. And I think on a Wednesday night, Y'all believe that, right? Y'all believe that. And you believe that how? By faith. You have a belief system. So does the atheist. The atheist who does not believe in God, believes in mere chance, and that by some circumstances we all got here, has a belief system. If you have a belief system, you call that a faith. Atheism is a faith. Not a very good one. In fact, a super flawed one. And one, if you don't repent of, if you're listening, will land you in eternal hell. We believe all things were created by God, by faith. Yes, it's faith. But our faith is reasonable. I mean, no one's going to go look at Ru Mount Rushmore for the first time and have never known it was there, just wandering through and just seeing Mount War Rushmore and go, wow, look how that mountain evolved. I mean, our faith is reasonable, but demonstrated on display. And on display how? Well, let's, and see, let's look and see how our faith is to be displayed. Verse 4, you have a man who is a worshiper by faith, and that is Abel. He's the first, uh, second born, of course, of, of Adam and Eve, but the, the first of the, of, the, of the second generation. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous. Why was, was, why was Abel commended as righteous? Why was he commended by God as righteous? He was a righteous man. Matthew 23, 35 says that. That means he was born again. He was saved because he had faith in God. And he had faith in salvation through Christ. Abel, all those years ago, in the Garden of Eden, had faith in Jesus Christ. Cain did not. According to 1 John 3, 12, Cain was lost. Cain was unconverted. Why? Difference between the two? One had faith, the other did not. One was commended, one was condemned. Then you have Enoch, another example of what it is to be a man of faith, where Abel worshipped by faith, and why? Because God said, this is what I expect through a sacrifice. Abel believed God and offered it, and therefore was righteous, not because of what he did, but because of what he believed. And because what he believed then led to what he did. Follow that, because now you have Enoch who's walking by faith. And because Enoch believed God, he walked with God. He didn't just sit back and go, I believe about God. He said, I believe God so much that it caused him to walk with God so faithfully that one day he's walking with God and he got raptured off of this earth. And so you have two guys walking faith faithfully, somewhat differently. They die differently. Abel dies a violent, murderous death. 
even though he's a man of faith. Enoch doesn't even die. I like how the old preacher put it. Enoch walked so closely to God, and one day he was walking with God that God said, hey, we're closer to my house than yours, so just come on home with me. I love that. But our journeys of faith differ. They're going to look different. But what links them together is that they are based in substance and conviction. What type? Verse 6 helps us. And without faith, it is impossible to please God, to be commended by God. For whoever would draw near to Him must do these things. Number one, must believe that God exists. Number two, that He's good, that He rewards those who diligently seek Him. So look, there is for those who have faith, commendation. And there is no commendation, no commendation by God without faith. And what kind of faith? Faith in substance, the substance of Jesus Christ. So just because someone says, I'm a spiritual person, I have faith. If that faith is misplaced, it is not commended by God, but condemned. True faith believes that God exists, that's the beginning, and that God is good, and He rewards those who diligently seek them, and rewards them with what? I mean, if we take the whole book, and this is how you have to study the Scripture, you look at this text, and you put it within the context of that chapter, and then the context of the entire book, we say, wait a minute, this whole section is, is right after the writer is telling the readers, guys, if you want to be rewarded with eternal life to get to God, it's not because you keep going back to your old religion, it's because you let go, and you come to Christ empty-handed and you have Him. It's Him that you need and you put your faith in Him and then you're rewarded with what? A relationship with God. And there's no other way to have a relationship with God. The blood of bulls and goats doesn't cut it. They all pointed to the day that Jesus would be that sacrifice that you would put your trust in and then when you did, you would be rewarded with what? Eternal life. Do you believe God and that He is a rewarder? He's a good God. If so, then this is where I want us to land for just a few minutes before we go and see the work of faith. We've seen Enoch walked with God, and he did that by faith, and Abel worshiped God, he did that by faith, but Noah worked. By faith, Noah being warned by God. Verse 7, by faith. Uh, By the way, do you see how the writer constantly is in the English, by faith, by faith, by faith? Why? It's so important to see that. There is no, there's no way forward for the readers in the first century with God except by faith in Christ. By faith. And there's no way forward for us tonight. If tonight you go, I really want God to work in my life. I want God to work through my life. I really want to please God. You cannot do it except by faith. This is so important. You can't please God. You can't see God work. You won't, you won't experience the, the power of God except by faith. So by faith, Noah being warned by God concerning events yet unseen. What events? He'd never seen it rain, y'all. He didn't grow up in Florida. The water came up from the bottom of the earth and watered the earth. He, he, he never saw it rain. So, I mean, he's hearing God say it's going to rain. He's like, what's that? In reverent fear, notice this, in reverent fear. He is in reverent fear. I mean, not only is he being told about something he's never, never experienced, he believes it so much because he, he just reveres God. So what does he do? He constructs an ark for the saving of his household. It's not like, you know, he, he built an ark near Doctor's Lake Marina. He's in the middle of the of a land with no water. This makes no sense. And not only that, it's going to take him, it's going to take him 120, I mean, it's going to take him longer to construct this art than it does the construction of the roads over in Lake Asbury. I mean, it's unbelievable. 120 years. And by this, what does he do? He condemns the world. And he becomes an heir of righteousness by faith. I borrow these, these headings from the Christ-centered expositional commentary that some of y'all are using for your table discussions. 
But just, just know this, there was a flood, y'all. There was a flood. The flood was not natural. And the flood was essential for biblical theology. It shows that God will punish sin, but he always makes a way of salvation. And the ark, it was real. It was real. But also a picture of the ultimate salvation in Jesus Christ. And when the storm of God's judgment comes, we're safe so long as we're in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. Now I want you to think about how this work of faith went. I think this can really help us tonight because I don't know about you guys, but I kind of think I do. If you're a Christian, you really do desire to see God work. You do desire to walk and follow His steps. You definitely desire that He's glorified in your life. You don't want to live a pedestrian, average life. You just don't. I know it. Because the Holy Spirit of God is in us and motivating us by grace forward, not to go back, not to shrink back, not to do anything but pursue God's will for our life. And that's hard, and it's scary, and we don't know what the future holds. That's why we have to walk by faith. And let's see how faith works. Let's see how faith works, because as we look at Noah, he's a great case study. I could have picked any one of these, but this is a great case study for how faith works, or how faith works in your life, or how you and I work by faith. Ready? First, he is warned. In his mind, he is thinking about what God has said. Noah, I'm done with all the wickedness that I see. Noah, I am going to destroy the earth. That's something you need to know, Noah. So Noah, he knows the truth. And he knows that God is not happy. It would be easy for Noah to look around and understand why God's not happy. Noah's a man of faith. He's a man who is a man of grace, the Bible says. And he's found favor in the eyes of the Lord. It's easy for him to see. It's messed up. I get it, God. I get it. I understand. And I believe that you can do this. It's your world. You spoke it into existence. You can do whatever you want with it. That's a good start. That's not enough. And that might be where some of you are right now. Oh, I know God can. I believe He can do anything He wants. One of my favorite movies, and y'all are going to laugh at this if you've ever seen it, is, uh, and it's one of the Kendrick Brother movies. If you know what those are, you know, like the um, Fireproof and um, Flywheel, Facing the Giants. I like that movie, Facing the Giants. I really like that movie, Facing the Giants. And I like that movie's theme. And then one of the things, if you don't know about it, it's, it's just a little country um, Christian school that is like the David against all the Goliaths. And uh, this coach comes in, and man, he's having a struggle winning. I mean, you know, th- if you've never seen it, it's just the underdog. And all of a sudden, man, they begin praying and preparing uh, to win. And it's a great story. And it's a cool story. And uh, just an aside, some of our friends now pastor in that same little town in Albany, and they coach it at school where that movie is patterned after, and I just noticed they won again Friday night. Anyway, so it's not just fake life. This is real life. It's pretty cool. But I'm watching this, and all through the movie, the question is asked like this, tell me what God can't do. And I mean, if you're going to expect rain, you better prepare for rain, right? I mean, like they, the coach in the movie and his wife, they want a baby so bad, but they can't have a baby, you know? And, and, and so they begin preparing to have a baby. Because what can God, what can't God do? And uh, this is why I'm such a sucker, because when that part of the movie comes up and the wife says to the coach, hey, welcome to the daddy club, our daddy team, I, I can't hardly watch that without quivering my lip, my chin. I mean, I, I love the theme, though. But this is where a lot of people stay. I know God can do anything. I believe it. 
And you really do. You really do. But it's yet not faith that pleases God. It's a start. We must believe God exists, that He is, meaning more than He is a reality, but that He is the Yahweh I am and can do all things. But we have to go beyond that because what does Noah do? He knows God can do anything, but what happens next is he has this incredible heart move. He has reverent fear. When you have reverent fear, you're moved. You have to see how the writer of Hebrews is with the Spirit of God marvelously marvelously telling us the, the, the steps here that are going on. He gets it, he believes it, and then it moves to his heart. And man, when you believe something in your heart, you, you, you're changed. Your value towards that, whatever it is, changes. So let's say, man, you, you meet somebody, you're, you're single, and, and you meet somebody as a single, and you go, oh, I, 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 I think I like this person. And then you realize that, that like you, and then you're like, wow, that's cool. I've got knowledge now. And then all of a sudden, that knowledge just starts getting your heart. Well, man, maybe I, I could see myself maybe marrying this person one day. And now you're starting to do what? everything's changing. You're moving towards that person. This is, this is a heart change. It's, I'm not just getting it and, and understanding the, the facts. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm believing in my heart, which leads then to what for Noah? Y'all, we got to get some saws and some wood together. We got to build an ark, and he begins to go to work. So faith starts in your head, it moves to the heart that moves us closer then to the object that we have faith in and we go to work. Because faith is always active. So if you say, yeah, I believe God, I believe Jesus died, and you have all that here, and you never let it go here, to then go, here, God, save me, you're not saved, no matter how much you believe it here. This is why forever preachers have said so many people are going to miss heaven by just a couple of feet. The distance between the head and the heart. Because true faith leads to action. Faith is active. Faith works. You say, well, I'm there. I, I I really want to, I believe God can do What is it that you're believing God for right now? By faith. That you've actually stepped out and said, God, not only do I believe you can do it, I'm thanking you right now that you're going to do it, and I'm trusting you by faith. You say, well, well, what if I fail? Who said you're a success? Well, what if I let God down? Anybody holding God up? What if I take the wrong direction? Do you don't think God can redirect? If you zig and you need to zag, he'll make sure you zag? If you're trusting him and all he asks you to do is to take one step at a time to put first the kingdom of God and follow me and in faith you step out and you trust him, will he not direct your path? It's, it's great that we believe this. You, you know this illustration maybe from years ago, but it, it was a great illustration. It's just probably embedded in a lot of our minds, but from Billy Graham, where Billy Graham pointed out an event that took place at Niagara Falls with the great Blondini, who was a tightrope walker across the falls. And he would draw large crowds as he walked across the tightrope, across the falls. If he fell, no safety net, he's going to die. But he was so good at what he did, he never stumbled, he never even came close. And one day, according to Billy Graham, the Blondini, the great Blondini, took a wheelbarrow and decided he would carry a wheelbarrow across the Niagara Falls. And then he put dirt, the weight of a man, inside the wheelbarrow, and he made it all the way across. No stumble, no issues, no problem at all. And so the Blondini asked the question, the great Blondini asked the question of the crowd that gathered around, how many of you believe, if I just put 200 pounds of dirt in this wheelbarrow, how many of you believe I can put a 200-pound man and go across? And they all said, we believe, we believe. And he said, can I get a volunteer? This is faith. It's not only believing, and that's where it starts. It moves to the heart, then the will to work. So move in the direction of faith. I can never witness. 
Wait a minute, God said you could. Yeah, I, I know, I know he's right. Okay? If he's right and you believe that you can be a witness, then begin praying, God, I believe you want me to be a witness. As you begin praying, God, you want me to be a witness. You begin praying for the lost, you're one. What happens, your heart begins to be moved and begins to be broken for the lost. And then you step out and go, I'm just going to go for it because, God, you told me I ought to and you told me you'd be with me and you told me that, 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 uh, that you're going to speak through me and give me the answer. I'm going to do it. And you step out in faith and what happens? I'm telling you, when you begin to trust God, you begin to see God work and you then become a faithful believer, not that you are anything, but you're watching God work, and it's amazing that you're just there when it happens. God's at work because you're faithful. You say, I, I don't know. You know, I, 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 know, I know at work, I, I could probably start a Bible study, but I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know if I, I can do it. What God laid on your heart to do? His word doesn't return void. It's a great thing. It's a great, how many of you believe this is a great book to study? How many of you believe a great book to study? I mean, it's a great book to study. You know, like, I think everybody ought to study this, then step out in faith and start it. What if I fail? What if nobody comes? What if nobody wants to hear? Well, it's just you and the time clock. That's fine. But eventually, if God's led you to do that, you step out in faith. I'm telling you, when we are obedient to God, every time He opens doors that we never thought could be opened, and He shows us what we never thought we would see. Just go. I mean, how many times have we just said, all right, Lord, yes. Stepped out because we know he can do abundantly above all we can ask or think. We know that. We believe that. But that begins to draw our affections to obedience. So when, when Noah does this, he condemns the world because they don't have faith. They're, not, they're, 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 they're telling Noah, you're crazy. He's preaching 120 years. But he's commended by God. And his faith condemns the world. It's true of uh, Abraham too. Look in verse 8 and verse 9 and then we'll wrap it up here. I'm not, going to, I'm not really going to give you some explanation here other than just a little bit of explanation. Um, I mean, no application here. But by faith, Abraham o obeyed when he was called to go out to the place. He was going to receive an inheritance, and he went out, not knowing where he, was, where he was going. So he left his home. He left his kin foot for the most part, except for Lot, and that's a whole other story. And he left the familiar. It was, he left his safety. Why? By faith. He had an eye. Why? For the future. Verse 9 and 10 tells us he was looking for a city whose foundation had a, had a foundation. I mean, he was living in tents. Tents do not have a foundation, y'all. They're dirt floors. But he lived in dirt floored tents because he believed one day He'd be in a city that had a foundation, and not just any foundation, but an eternal foundation, and we know that city is the city of God. In Revelation 21, you can read about that city. It's a real city, and he looked forward to the future when that city would come, and he was by faith seeking after God. By faith, we know God rewards. By faith, we know God's ultimate reward is forthcoming. Faith trusts in a trustworthy God. Faith is not our ability, it's his. Faith is trust in him. Faith, trust, and a trustworthy God. That's what faith is. That's why none of us here could say, well, I could never walk the life of faith because we can because he's faithful. Faith overcomes. Faith overcomes difficulties. The writer of Hebrews is telling those who are being persecuted and under pressure to quit. Don't. Trust God. Trust God. Faith leads to radical reorientation of our life. When we start to believe God and obey God, our life changes. It changes. The way we spend our money and our time and our energy, it all changes how we see the future. Faith is expressed, too. It's never secret. It's public. I mean, it shows the world that we believe God, whether we want it to or not, because you can't build an ark without people going, what's that? You cannot live a life of faith without people saying, what's that? What are you doing? Why? Why? why, why? I believe God. I believe God. I'm trusting Him with money. I'm trusting Him with my life. I'm trusting Him with my kids. Making decisions that are counter-cultural, okay? Counter this world's system. Because I believe God, and you can't do that secretly. 
The life of faith is always a public life. And it leads us to follow Jesus. How we follow Jesus in this room is always going to look different for each person. But we'll always be, all be going in the same direction. Faith is active. It's true of salvation. I mean, here's the reality. Let's say something happens to you. You're on your way home. You say, I think something's going on. I need to get to the doctor. I need to get to the emergency room. So you get to the emergency room. And they bring you in and they do their test and they say, oh man, you need surgery now. And the surgeon comes in and he tells you, perhaps you, you sign 50 papers and uh, they take you into surgery. And you wake up and you say, Whew, so glad I, took, so glad I took care of this. So glad I took care of this issue. What do you mean? It was the doctor that did the surgery. Ah, yeah, but I drove myself here. No, faith in the doctor is what got you there. But it was the doctor that did the work after all of his schooling and expertise and effort to bring you to the place of healing. It may not be the greatest illustration, but that's how faith works in salvation. I don't do anything. Faith's just the vehicle to get me to God. I come empty-handed. I have nothing to offer, but I trust His grace, and that's the way salvation works. And it never stops for the believer to continue to live that life of constantly coming to God and trusting Him by faith with open hands and saying, hey, here's, here's my life, here's my business, here's my health, my kids, my grandkids. I'm going to trust you with them. And because I'm trusting you, because I know you got it, I'm going to act accordingly. It's not simply the prayer of God. I, I, I know, I know, I believe, I believe you can it's the prayer of, I believe you can, because I know your word, that leads me to a closer heart, love, affection to him that, that's, that, that drives me, I mean, just drives me to just act accordingly. That's faith. Faith is active. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you, God, you've given us the substance of our salvation in Christ, and that, God, we can seek after you because of Jesus, and that God, by faith, trusts you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you want to talk to somebody today, tonight, about maybe there's something going on in your life, I need to trust God, I've been struggling with something, Pastor. At our Connect Point, we've asked a few people to be there to pray and to, to, to talk to you about the message tonight. We also have small groups that can, um, you can get a part, be a part of and, and talk through some of, of ways to apply this text to your life and uh, understand this even more to hear experienced mature Christians uh, even give their testimonies of their journey of faith it would be really helpful all right I'm going to give it over to Brian McNair hey thanks Brian appreciate you're going to close this out